sculpture. And again, as Nick was saying, um, Sai, apart from a 17-year gap in the middle of his career, Sai always made sculpture alongside his painting. And so when I began the show, I actually was going to exclude um, Twombly's sculpture and just think of the two painters as painters, Poussin and Twombly. And then as I worked on it, that somehow felt a bit um, dishonest or cowardly. I thought it was more interesting to um, flag up all the differences as well as the similarities. And so what I wanted to do was where it was appropriate to have sculptures by Twombly that would somehow add something to the room. And I should say that every room is very much conceived as a whole. Um, and it's not about pairing one work with another. Sometimes there are, um, there are pairs, but really every room is more about a whole, a unity. And I wanted everyone to be able to read that room and to get a sense of what that might be about without having to read a wall label. I didn't want things to have to be reliant upon lots of text. There is text. You can read them if you want, but I wanted it to work visually. And so all of the sculptures in the exhibition somehow add something to the paintings. And so here, of course, the point is about this um, sarcophagus. And so if you think about the sarcophagus in Arcadia, Twombly's also making is, you know, these very sort of funereal works in, uh, in sculpture as well. I'm curious to ask Nick, actually, at this point, what he thinks of this um, comparison. This particular comparison? No, no, or of the exhibition as a whole. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, because, you know, I, I didn't do this to sort of... Um, it was a risk, and I, I didn't know how it was going to work, but I, I, it was, I was too fascinated not to take a gamble. And so I'm always very curious to hear what people think. Um, it works for me because it makes me th look at Poussin in a different way. Um, it works for, probably it makes me more conscious of what an intimate painter Poussin can be, and also how surprisingly painterly he is. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow I think of, I mean, if you asked me six months you know, before I thought about this show, to describe a characteristic Poussin painting, I would have described it in terms that were about austerity, mm -hmm. about schema, about drawing, to some extent about colour, but not about the use of paint. Mm. And somehow seeing these paintings juxtaposed with the, with the Tomblers makes me very conscious of how they've actually been painted. Mm. It made me conscious in Tombly of his attachment to Italy and to the landscape and to nature mm. um, rather more than to his attachment to the antique as such, yep. and uh, perhaps I was expecting to find more of the antique in mm. Twombly, especially set against Poussin, than I found myself engaging with. But that may be, perhaps if there'd been more sculpture, one would have had that sense more strongly. I'm not criticizing, no, no. I'm not criticizing the chair. <laughs> um, and I'm not his boss, by the way. <laughs> um, but I think that it just, for me, the show does make me think about each artist in a slightly different way. Mm. And in a sense, you can't expect more from an exhibition than that. It's sort of, I mean, for me, definitely, it, the, there's an element of estrangement that if you're looking at a person and then you turn to a Twombly, it almost makes you rethink. So, for example, the, I think in terms of what Nick was saying about the painterliness of Poussin, which we tend to... Um, underestimate sometimes. I mean, this beautiful painting, yeah. Ronaldo Nomida, which of course is heavily influenced by Venetian painting, by people like Titian that we know um, Poussin was looking at. If you look at the background, that sky, I mean, it's so beautiful and it, he's gone to such efforts to really capture this sort of fleeting light. And then if you think about the Twombly, I mean, again, I, iconographically, these are very, very different, but actually there's these strange muffled chimes within each painting, which I find really interesting. I mean, I feel for me this is a sort of... Um, it's an ongoing process about looking at these two painters, and it's, it's been, a, for me, a challenge to sort of keep looking at them and, and to go back and look at things in a different light. I mean, some comparisons are more direct, and I think in some ways, to be very bluntly honest, I mean, less rewarding in a way. I mean, not that you shouldn't do it, but, for example, these two uh, works, which are also in the same room, this is really about the idea of Venus, but I think, although it's interesting to see these two things together, it's more to do with um, legibility, so that there's a, there's a legible construct for the room. And you can kind of, there's an interesting point here to make about gender and about the way that, you know, these gods are embodying uh, different ideals of male and female beauty, of sexuality. You have the same thing in the, the Poussin painting. I mean, think about how radical 
this is as, as a depiction of gender, gender in the early 17th century where you have this you know, uh, passive male and this dominant female. And this is something Poussin does uh, in at least three different paintings, three different subjects. There's, there's a very, very sort of dominant woman uh, looming over a man. And it's something that in it also chimes with, uh, with some of Twombly's paintings, that, that, you know, this idea about male and female and the relationship between the two. But I think really, for me, what's more interesting than, say, just looking at the, the names and the, and the, uh, you know, the ideas is, is just the handling of paint. That's been one of the, mm. the joys for me of looking at these, these two painters side by side. And in a way, that's a, a much more simple idea, but a much richer one. Shall we um, open it up for questions at this point, rather than going on too much? Is there um, okay, there's a microphone? Um, do we have any questions, or should I just carry on, carry on. <laughs> talking? <laughs> or do you want to just... Uh, yeah, we question. have one there. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the method <clears throat> in which uh, Cy Twombly actually worked. Mm -hmm. and uh, how he produced these paintings and what was actually happening mm -hmm. in his mind or that's an interesting question i guess we could begin I mean, here uh, the direct answer to your question is what was happening for most of the time not much i mean as i said earlier i think he spent an enormous amount of time sitting in the studio thinking about how to translate in certain instances or how to give an equivalence in others to a mood, a feeling that he had experienced either directly himself or through poetry or reading. He spent a lot of time reading poetry. What for him was so strong about Poetry was that it was what he called a condensed phrase. Sometimes those phrases appeared in the paintings. Mm. But in a way, it's about condensed emotion. It's about intensity of emotion. And I think the paintings are about trying to achieve that intensity in, a, in the visual form. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean so you have to load the canvas with paint. You can be intense in so many different ways. Um, but I think it always started, it was always rooted in experience or vision. I mean, I think for a long time, the paintings were seen as being difficult to read. They were described as being abstract. Um, but Troy himself said, you know, I'm not an abstractionist. Um, there has to be something well, he, he, what he actually said was there has to be history behind the thought in order to give me clarity and energy. So it was always rooted in a very direct experience, personal experience or a personal vision. Mm. I mean, these are a, a starting point in a way, and I think the, the, the manner of painting or drawing changed radically over the years. It, it had the same origin, but it, um, it changed according to the type of paint he used, for example, acrylic versus oil, or the scale he works on, or, um, but of course these are the, the sort of breakthrough drawings that he made in the mid-50s, which are this effort to somehow grapple and decode um, Jackson Pollock's all over compositions. And so Twombly, rather than trying to outdo Pollock through paint, takes up a, a pencil and makes these drawings in the dark with the lights off so that they have this link to surrealist automatic writing, and these in a way the, the, the works before this, before, say, 53, 55, are interesting, but they're sort of atypical. If you look at them, his, his work in a series now, whereas these, of course, um, come back and repeat, uh, you know, until the very end. If you think about the Ninny's paintings, which he talks about from the 1970s, so these are a, a sort of a huge um, breakthrough. And I think, again, one thing that's very interesting to think about in the exhibition, really just to think about in front of the works, is just painting and process. That's been really... Um, for me, is something very interesting to think about in the way that uh, Poussin is so concentrated and the way that his mark making is so um, meticulous and Twombly is very, very diffuse. And that's the main difference, I think, between them. More than abstraction versus figuration or even age, it's about sort of a, a way of uh, making these images. Another question there. Um, 
mentioned that um, he read Rilke, and I just w wondered if you could say a little more about, you know, thinking of him as a painter of light and a painter of nature and that association, sort of pantheist, if there's more to say about that, if you'd like to elaborate on, you know, what he got from Rilke. So you mean poetry alongside nature, basically? Well, the sort of, yeah, Rilke's relationship with nature. Oh, yeah. And, you know, his. Sure. His. Yeah. Um, should I say this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so um, why was Rilke important, really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's many poets that Twombly um, referred to over and over again and went back to, and Rilke is probably one of his um, favorites and the one that he used time and time again, from the, especially from the 1970s. I think 68 is the first painting that refers to Rilke. And then, especially in the 70s, the 80s, and then, you know, t till the end, those rose paintings that we looked at. Um, yeah, nature and poetry, that's a really big theme. It's a big theme for both Poussin and Twombly. It's really interesting. And, I mean, one thing that I wanted to, to think about here was the way that um, some of those ideas are personified by ancient gods. So, for example, Pan, you know, the penultimate room of the exhibition is about Pan, but it isn't really, it's about nature. It's about the way that the ancients saw uh, nature personified in Pan and vice versa. And that's what both Poussin and Twombly are thinking about. Or the way that the room about Apollo and Parnassus is about Apollo and Parnassus, but it's really about poetry. Um, and so I think for Twombly's engagement with Rilke, um, it shifts over the years, but one thing that's very, very um, important is, um, is Orpheus and the way that Rilke writes about Orpheus. And so often, the poets that Twombly uses access, it's like a palimpsest, basically. So often, um, you know, he'll, he'll use a poet to access a much uh, more ancient idea or archetype. So often, these things are layered. But there's, yeah, there's a real relationship. There's a whole series of works that Twombly made about Rilke and Orpheus. Uh, can I ask, uh, um, I think it's a really stupid question, but I'm hoping it might be profound at base. Um, the writing that uh, Twombly uses in his paintings, mm. is that his handwriting, or is it a form of calligraphy? And if so, what, what does calligraphy mean in these circumstances? Do you want to? It's an exaggerated form of his handwriting. <laughs> And it's often quite self-conscious, especially when it becomes large. Mm. Um, less so when it's several lines of text, as in, for instance, The Four Seasons and elsewhere. Um, it's a point of reference. It's a compositional device. Mm. It hovers between description and analogy. Mm. And it just serves many different purposes. But it still is handwriting. It's not like when you asked him to sign a loan form, you got this very carefully written. It was basically the same. Yeah. It's just that, as Nick said, the scale sometimes would amplify certain quirks but um, it's his handwriting, I think. And it's sometimes more legible in reproduction than it is when you view it. Mm. I mean, I was reading the words on the Passer Regard sculpture mm. the other day and trying to decipher them. Then I looked at the reproduction in the book and it's immediately visible yep. what it is. Yep. Curious. Just a couple of questions. One is, uh, um, was he a man, probably, uh, of uh, tremendous uh, sort of uh, um, temperament? And uh, I noticed one of the paintings the other day that across the top is, is scrawled some sort of, uh, I've forgotten the word actually, but it did seem to, 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 to come from a sort of tortured soul or frustrated or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
So I'd like to know if, if he had these sort of temperamental um, phases. And secondly, of course, I would like to, to know, was he interested in other cultures? For instance, uh, Africa, which uh, so many painters, you know, Picasso and so on, uh, love to, to interact to some degree. Uh, although I noticed a lot of his, his textures and so on are mostly white, but that's all right. Uh, he might have had some sort of African uh, inspiration. Can I answer the first, and Nick can answer the second? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I think he'll give a better answer on the second than I will. Ah. He can probably come back on the first. Ah, okay. I would, I would say that the temp... The, the temp I don't think he was tortured, but I think that he was given to melancholy. And you can argue that's partly to do with where he came from. Mm -hmm. It's probably to do with spending a lot of time on his own. Um, there's a whole series of paintings. Well, um, Nick showed one. We showed one of the long painting in the museum in um, Dominion Museum in yeah. Houston. No, the, the, which yeah. is is a painting that deals very much with the idea of melancholy mm. and very consciously so. And there were long periods, I think in the 70s and 80s, where he painted very little. That was one of the few paintings he made. He turned a little bit towards sculpture, but actually he was quite unproductive for a long period. I mean, undoubtedly, had he died at the age of 60, he would have had a very different reputation from the one that he will now have, having lived another 20 years or more. Mm. I mean, just to pick up on that point of melancholy, I think you see this in the yeah. Four Seasons, yeah. where... I mean, I think, first of all, there's a big difference. I think the, the painting... It, I wouldn't say um, it's more aggressive or melancholic, but it's definitely more anxious in the early part of his career, just the, the type of mark-making, that kind of mm. fidgety incising and scribbling. It just it conveys a more anxious mood. And then if you think about the later work, which becomes much more kind of um, expansive. Anyway, I don't want to try and find the image. But the, the later work seems to become much more effusive, expansive, relaxed. But just to think about the idea of melancholy, I mean, I think the Four Seasons are really incredible because the more I've looked at these, if you think, really, he's using these different emotional moods, but it's to reflect the subject and what's fitting and the, and the season and the, mm -hmm. the, what he's seeing out of the window. So, for example, these are all painted pretty much looking out of the window in Gaeta, overlooking the Bay of Gaeta, where you have this big expanse of water, light passing over it. It reflects you know, the light of the day, but the seasons, of course. Think about summer, which, where you have this haze, this white and yellow kind of acrid paint. And then think about winter, which is basically the same palette, this white and yellow with some black, the same type of mark making, but it's, it's a sort of, rather than a haze, it's like a fog. And so you get, you get not just the, the, the weather, but you get this sort of, you get this tone, this emotional, uh, mood, which he was obviously really transcribing. I mean, these are very, very careful representations of each season, as much as Poussin's Four Seasons. They're completely abstract, more or less, apart from, say, some boats. But you get the idea of the weather and the different moods that that evokes in all of us, which I think is really extraordinary. And then to answer the second question about um, other cultures, that's really important. And something which this show sort of uh, occludes by necessity, but the big big difference between, say, Twombly and Poussin is that um, Poussin really didn't get to travel beyond France and Italy and see, you know, apart from seeing uh, maybe some antiquities or some ancient artifacts from other, but there wasn't that much, whereas Twombly was fortunate to travel widely. And, for example, that first trip, which I referred to, to uh, Italy and North Africa in 1952-53, there's almost nothing from the trip um, that refers to classical Mediterranean Roman culture. Everything he made, all of the big uh, breaks, breakthroughs on the trip were in Morocco and North Africa. And it's where he said um, he began the idea of incising and scratching into the surface of the paint. He made this series of um, sketches called the North African Sketchbook, which were inspired partly by seeing all of these sort of vernacular architectural forms in Morocco. So these kind of ant hills, beehives, different sort of textiles. He made textiles, he made uh, textile wall hangings, which are now lost, sadly. We only see them in images, but he was really experimenting the different colors, these kind of, you know, 
primitive voodoo fetish sculptures, which reflected in his sculptures thereafter. And then the really interesting thing is that after he comes back from Morocco, back to Rome, and spends two months in Rome, he goes to the Pigarini uh, Ethnographic Museum in Rome. And this is where he's really spoiled for choice. He could have been sketching the Colosseum, he could have been sketching... And he really doesn't look at any of that. I mean, he's looking at that, but he doesn't sketch it. He sketches these artifacts in the Pigarini Museum. And I've been to the museum, and I've actually gone through the collection. You can actually, not in this page of the sketchbook, but there's other pages where you can match exactly the objects. It's that carefully observed. He's actually sketching particular objects. So that's very interesting, and it's a major, major point of distinction, just to do with biography between Twombly and Poussin, that Twombly spent his entire career traveling and going to you know, the Middle East, Mexico, and beyond. So many of the sculptures and paintings refer to uh, other cultures. It's not just about sort of European high culture. Is there another question? Thank you very much. Thanks. I had a couple of questions. Um, one was about his working method. Mm. I wondered whether he were always worked with the work on the wall or whether he put it on the floor. And whether he, does he always stretch the canvases afterwards? And what about his use of mediums and things? Do you know about that? Yeah. And the other thing I just wanted to ask was the relationship between his work to his son's work, whether you had any comments to make on that. I think... As Nick mentioned, he increasingly used acrylic because it dries more quickly. Um, and although, and because of its properties, I think he thinned it to a degree and he used mediums that would allow him to keep it, particularly in this series and the, the rose series, allow it to keep it wet for a while, rather longer than it might have been so that he could paint into the wet. Um, he mainly painted on a canvas that was on the wall, but I think there are instances where he worked on the floor. Not many, but I think principally he worked on the wall. Um, and I don't think it's invariable, but certainly for the last 30 years or more, he worked on canvas and then stretched the painting rather than working on a stretched canvas. Mm. I mean, they're inherently vertical yeah. paintings, the way that the paint is, is allowed to drip down. You see it here on Leander uh, in the current exhibition where there's the, that watery convulsive surface but, which is then sort of amplified by the, the paint streaking down the canvas. Mm -hmm. And unlike Pollock, there's never any attempt to deny the kind of verticality of painting. And I think Sy did say that it was, a, it was more like a mural painting or a fresco. That, and even when he was making the works in the 60s, it, it was the same technique. He would tack the canvas to a wall. And just that hardness of the wall behind the canvas, it gives you those very, very definite, crisp lines. And there's a kind of, there's a, there's a resistance to the paintbrush or to the pencil. And so it has more to do with the kind of classical idea of fresco and mural technique than even than oil painting on, a, on an easel which is very interesting. And with the exception of the, well, one of the, one of the large canvases in the 50 Days of Dillium, and then the group of works that he completed towards the end of his li life and the, really after 2000, mm. most of the paintings are not much more than two meters high. A lot of them are two meters square, and that is really essentially the stretch both directions. Yeah. So most of them, I think, were painted quite close to, mm. and close up. And as Nick mentioned, in Gaeta and elsewhere, actually in quite small rooms. Mm. Yep. Um, a very obvious sort of question. Did he um, have any favorite Poussin paintings, and did he know the Dulwich Poussins, which is very important, um, particularly well? Mm. Um, yeah, we, we spoke about this. I mean, he... I don't want to be misleading. And basically, the, the thing with Twombly is that you could talk to him about things, but you could never really pin him down, per se. If you asked him a particular question, he would tend to just say, oh, I don't know, or it wasn't the way his mind worked. And it was very difficult to kind of really try to uh, elicit certain answers or information from him. 
And so as time went on, I always found the best thing to do was just to really sort of shoot the breeze, as it were, and just go for lunch and talk and see where the conversation led you. But, and of course, over the last three years, what I've been trying to do is to piece together this sort of interesting and slightly odd relationship between these two painters and to find out. And it, I mean, to be honest, it, it is necessarily fragmented. I mean, Sai would never have sat down and said, oh yes, I looked at that then and I did that. And I, you had to really piece things together. And he, he was always very resistant to things, to being reduced to one answer or one interpretation. I think he always wanted to leave things open-ended. But we do know that, of course, he was looking at Poussin throughout his career from the 1950s, when he was in his 20s, to, you know, very recently. And he certainly, when you talked about certain paintings, so, I mean, he, for example, you know, we worked on this checklist together and he knew everything that would be in the show and which order and which room. And, uh, and he, you know, he contributed to that. And he, you know, I mean, he was, and again, to be very honest, he was very wary of this idea, uh, he was nervous. And I, was I, think gonna, you know, I was going to ask you whether he regretted saying, if I could have been a painter in another time, it would have been Poussin. Um, <laughs> I never asked him if he, and I, I mean, I think for him, I think if, if he were here now, he'd probably wince to hear that, because I think he, and that quote has been used so much in the last couple of weeks, and I've, I've winced a bit um, sometimes when I've heard it, because uh, although I think Poussin is, and so, for me it's the most resonant, uh, forebear that you could possibly think of. And the reason why I think it's a particularly interesting one to think of with Twombly is that they're so seemingly different, but I think it really captures what Twombly spent his life doing, which was thinking about painting, about mythology, all of the things that Twombly was doing were things that Poussin was doing. And I don't think Twombly was trying to copy him or emulate him, but I think it's a, there's this idea of sort of kindred spirits, which I think is really beautiful. I think, you know, it's just a lovely idea. And for me, Certainly reading the reviews and people saying, oh, well, really, these paintings belong more with, say, Monet. It's sort of, although it's very interesting to look at those two painters side by side, and that will be done in an exhibition which will yeah, be happening, next year, next year. you know. Um, I, and again, it's a very subjective personal reading, but for me, when I think of Sai, I, and even before the exhibition, I think of Poussin, I think about painters that were devoted their lives to the same thing. And I think if you, you know, for, for me, that was resonant. Um, so... Yeah, but certainly we talked about these paintings, the paintings at Dulwich, other paintings. Sai knew them. I mean, he knew Poussin back to front, as he did many other artists' works. I mean, he, he collaged books, you know, reproductions of Poussin's drawings from books into works, which you see in the, the penultimate room from 77, that, that drawing back in earlier. There's a collage of the Poussin. And that book came out, like, the month before he made that work, so he got hold of the book right away. So you can piece these things together. But at the same time, just for sort of the record, I wouldn't want to say that Poussin is the key to Twombly. It's just one lens to look through his work. And for me, it's, it's, it, it's my lens, and it's the one that I find the most resonant. But many other people have different uh, other ways to approach the work. Can I add something else? He, he was clearly hugely affected by poetry. Mm -hmm. What about music? Because it may be a wild... Um, um, a mistake on my part, but there's some resonance with Harrison Bertwistle's music to me, if you are familiar with that mm. at all. Do you want to talk about music? I mean, I know Sai talked about it a bit in the interview with you. I don't, well, I certainly, I, I don't think he knew Harrison Bertwistle's music. Um, I don't think that. I don't think music was that important to him. But I think that he did recognise that it was a language that people could hold in common. In a rather different way from the way in which they he thought they couldn't hold the visual language in common. Mm. He thought that there was a that the the order the order and the. I suppose the syntax, in a way, of music was more easily understood by people than was the connections within the visual. And he was envious of music composers and musicians for that reason. Mm. What he had no interest in, in, in su perhaps surprisingly, given when he grew up, was jazz. No interest in jazz and improvisation. 
Both of these gentlemen work very closely with Sai Twombly and, and knew him well. Uh, we, I will not get that uh, opportunity now, sadly. It was one of the great regrets about this exhibition is that I shan't get to meet him after all. But I feel like I've had a real insight uh, in, into how his mind worked. I've, I personally have always thought that both Poussin and Twombly have something of the lyric poet to them. And I think that's been confirmed here tonight. It also, I'm very grateful for seeing these wonderful images. Because in many ways, you, you see that the most extraordinary possible exhibition of Twombly's work must have been in his own studio. Mm -hmm. And so to see these images like this is an extraordinary privilege. Uh, my thank you to both of you very much. Thank you.